Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Cynthia Caro, the Vice President at the Conservancy overseeing conservation science and community greening. Today's webinar is about our work to study and create pollinator habitat in our gardens and on our nature preserves. Many flowers and trees bloom with the help of pollinators, and one in every three bites of food we eat comes from crops pollinated by bees, butterflies, birds, bats, and other animals. So clearly pollinators are very important to our economy and to our environment. However, many pollinator species face an uncertain future <clears throat> due to invasive plants and insects, <clears throat> habitat loss, disease, and other factors. <clears throat> this is a very important issue and one in which nearly everyone can make a difference. So we're thrilled that so many people are here with us today. You'll learn how we create, protect, and study habitats that provide food and shelter for these important animals and insects, and how you also can support pollinators. First, let me tell you briefly about some of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy's projects and programs. We're a nonprofit organization in our 91st year of operation. We own more than four 14,000 acres of land in 16 counties that are free for everyone to enjoy nature. We have conserved more than a quarter million acres of natural lands, protected or restored more than 3,000 miles of rivers and streams, and assessed thousands of wildlife species and their habitats. We've planted 107,000 trees and 130 community flower gardens and we own and steward Falling Water, a UNESCO World Heritage location in Mill Run, Pennsylvania. All of this is accomplished thanks to the support of more than 10,000 members and volunteers of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. For more information and how to get involved, please visit our website at waterlandlife.org. In today's webinar, two experts on our staff will discuss our work with pollinator habitat and give you tips on creating habitat for bees, butterflies, and birds in your own backyard. Betsy Lepo is our invertebrate zoologist with the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And Lori Kofalt is a PLNA certified horticulturist and the horticulture coordinator for our community greening department. We're really excited about this webinar and we think you'll enjoy it. It's being recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow. There will be time at the end for questions and answers. So please type your questions into the Q&A spot at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll get to as many of these as we can at the end. So without further ado, Betsy, Please take it away. Thank you, Cynthia. Can you hear me okay? Great. So let's start with the basic question. What is a pollinator? Simply put, a pollinator is an animal that moves pollen from one flower to another, essentially fertilizing the plant while going about its business, feeding on nectar or collecting pollen. All of the insects pictured here are examples of pollinating insects, from butterflies and moths, to bees and wasps, to beetles and ants and flies. We have a lot of diversity in pollinators in Pennsylvania, particularly in the insect order Lepidoptera, which is our butterflies and moths. Here are pictures showing representatives of each of the six families and 155 species of butterflies in Pennsylvania from the iconic spice bush swallowtail at top left to the little Delaware skipper at bottom right, spreading its wings skipper style. But that is just a shadow of the diversity we find in the moths. In Pennsylvania, we have over 2,100 species of moths and we're still counting. And we don't have time to investigate all 61 moth families. So I identified the six most species rich families of moths in Pennsylvania to illustrate them. So nearly half of 
the most species rich families uh, of moths in Pennsylvania are micromoths. These include the pyralids, crambids, and tortricids. Those are three examples in the top row. These are small moths with wingspans generally less than three quarters of an inch. Micromoths include many stem borers, root borers, leaf rollers, and leaf miners. The three groups at the bottom represent our largest families of moths, um, the macro moths. And these families don't include some of the best known moths like the Cecropia moth at left, which is in the giant silk moth family. So just a lot of diversity and many, many species. As larvae or caterpillars, Lepidoptera are particularly important to songbirds, which need an abundance of these tender morsels to feed their young. As adults, they contribute to pollination while continuing to feed the birds. Moths are especially popular with nighttime hunters like whippoorwills, night hawks, and screech owls. So just remember that more often than not, it's a good thing when you see chew marks on your native plants. That means you're growing food for your birds. Now bees get the most attention as pollinators because they are so efficient at it. There are at least 437 species of bees in Pennsylvania and they contribute to pollinating all the plants in our natural areas, gardens, and agricultural crops. Examples of bees found in each of the six families of bees are shown here. I'll walk you through uh, some of the families of bees and wasps to give you an, a sense of their diversity and the variety of their life histories. Some bees dig their holes and, and some bees and wasps dig their holes uh, not in wood but in the ground. These are digger bees and minor bees and wasps. They need areas of bare ground, especially well-drained and sandy sites. You can provide these areas by clearing away mulch or plants from an area and exposing the, the bare ground. Some of our native bees and wasps build their nests in existing holes in wood or hollow plant stems. These are the leaf cutter bees, mason bees, and mason wasps. Leaf cutters line nest tubes with leaves and mason bees and wasps use mud to partition the cells that house their brood. You can provide homes naturally for these bees and wasps by planting trees and shrubs that have hollow stems, such as box elder, elderberry, blackberries, raspberries, and hydrangeas. Leave the dead hollow stems stand over winter and for as long as you can in the spring to allow overwintering bees to emerge. Bumblebees are probably our most familiar and charismatic bees. They are also our only native colonial or social bees. And we also have an example of a social wasp up there up in the upper right, that's our paper wasps. Uh, bumblebees are predominantly ground nesters, but they do not dig their own nests. They rely on existing holes and tunnels, especially those abandoned by rodents, often in hedgerows and at the edges of forests. And they like uh, the bases of clumps of warm season grasses is another safe place that they can place their nests. Keeping brush piles and leaving down wood provides habitat for bumblebees to nest. Now our wasp pollinators are also predatory like the paper wasps or parasitoids like this grass carrying wasp who partitions her nest chambers with long blades of grass. While the adults feed on nectar, their young must be reared on the flesh of other insects and spiders. And some pollinate, pollinators are parasites of other pollinators sneaking into their nests and hiding their own eggs in amongst the eggs of their hosts. So we've talked about pollinators, but what is pollination to a plant? Pollination is the method by which many plants reproduce. Plant reproduction begins with the transfer of pollen from a stamen, which is the male part of the plant, to the pistil, which is the female part. Some plants rely on wind or water for pollination, but 75% of our native plants rely on pollinating insects. And um, a stationary plant uh, entices pollinators to help it with reproduction by offering energy and nutrients through its pollen and nectar. In exchange, the insects move the plant's pollen around. Cross-pollination with the help of insects generally yields healthier and more numerous offspring for the plant. Many flowers have an open floor plan which allows access to most pollinating insects. Others restrict access by having flower shapes that only specific sized pollinators can access. Restricted access helps 
helps plants ensure they get the most effective pollinator. Bees, like many insects, can see ultraviolet light. So many flowers have ultraviolet nectar guides on their petals. These function like neon landing strips, guiding insects to the nectaries. Now here's a few fun pollination facts. Uh, insects pollinate 78% of all flowering plants in temperate regions such as Pennsylvania. Some plants depend on a single species of pollinator for reproduction and vice versa. Uh, bee pollination generates $24 billion in crop value every year in the US. And bees pollinate plants that are really important for human health, such as fruits, vegetables, and nuts. Now, broad declines in insect diversity and abundance have been documented in hundreds of scientific papers over the past few decades. I've picked just a few of them here to highlight sort of where our understanding is of these declines. Um, in a review of over 73 um, scientific studies, uh, this paper from Sanchez Bio, and I'm not sure how to say the name there, uh, from 2019 found that declines may lead to the extinction of 40% of the world's insect species over the next few decades, which is really a frightening uh, figure. Uh, and it's, there's global decline, but certainly also in the US, 52% of US native bees surveyed are declining. One in four are imperiled. At least 13% of the bee species in Pennsylvania have not been seen in the past 18 years. Uh, domestic honeybees are down 60% compared to 60 years ago. So again, 75% of the world's food crops are animal pollinated. So we're really dependent on pollinators for food production. Uh, but us, there's been studies showing that 25 to 38% of our crop systems are impacted by insufficient pollination. So this obviously is going to have big implications, um, both here in the US and abroad. Um, there are already declines in human health documented that are tied to loss of pollinator crop yields. Pollinator crops offer some of our healthiest foods. So as these become increasingly expensive because they're not as productive as they were in the past, then they become more difficult for lower income people to um, afford. Uh, so there's no single factor responsible for all the declines in insects. There are many factors and they interact in many different ways depending on land use, climate, and other environmental and human factors. So this slide just highlights some of the biggest and most widespread threats from habitat loss and fragmentation to industrial agriculture and the use of, you know, the widespread use of pesticides and herbicides, um, air and light pollution, invasive species, even deer overbrowsing of plants that they need um, to feed on. Climate change is an overarching threat. And just a particularly untimely and unfortunate change in our ability to study the impacts of pesticides in particular um, on insect and human health is currently underway um, in the US where a major US pesticide data set is being um, systematically dismantled. So this was one of the most comprehensive data sets on pesticides that was publicly available and scientists across the country would rely on this data set to study the effects of pesticide use on human health and the environment. Um, and to understand, you know, how changes in pest management, you know, influence, influences agricultural productivity. So just imagine, you know, public health surveillance, you know, like watching disease in humans without having disease surveillance um, or climate change without greenhouse gas monitoring, like without understanding how pesticides are being used, it's really hard to know how they're going to impact us. So there's a QR code there if you want to learn more about, about this and, and what's going on with that data set. Um, in Pennsylvania, another limitation to poll pollinator conservation is that intrastural invertebrates, which includes our majority of our pollinators, are so-called orphan taxa in the state. So in Pennsylvania, there's no, um, you know, they don't, terrestrial invertebrates and rare insects do not have state level protection because there is no state agency responsible for them. There are a handful of invertebrates that are currently protected or under review um, for protection by the Environmental Protection Agency through the Endangered Species Act, um, such as the rusty patched bumblebee pictured here. Uh, but lack of state level jurisdiction hampers investment in research, management, conservation, and protection of rare and declining terrestrial invertebrates. So I mentioned earlier that there are at least 23 um, introduced species of bees in Pennsylvania. 
And I want to talk a little bit more about one of them, the honeybee, because I, they are very important in agriculture, but they have had some unintended impacts on our native bees. So honeybees fall into the category of a farm animal like sheep or cows or chickens. Uh, they were brought to the US in 1622 by European settlers. They're used for honey production and for pollination of crops that were also introduced to North America, such as almonds, apple trees, and melons. Uh, they are cared for in managed hives that can be kept on farms or in suburban yards or even on city rooftops. So my intention with these next few points is not to vilify honeybees as an invertebrate zoologist. I am fascinated by the complex social lives of bees and I love honey. So honeybees, they're not inherently good or bad, um, but we just want to think about them um, and, and understand how they may have impacts on uh, this landscape that we've introduced them into. Uh, so just remember that they survive here with intensive help from humans. They live in large colonies prone to infections and diseases. They're transported nationally and internationally, which facilitates the spread of new diseases, and they compete with native bees for resources. Consider that uh, an active hive at the peak of summer may have between 40,000 and 60,000 bees in it, and the workers forage in a radius of up to five miles away from their hive. Um, and they drop pests and pathogens on flowers where native bees can pick them up. This is the door dirty doorknob effect. Uh, one study found that one in 11 flowers has a bee pathogen on it. So do we need honeybees? Well, we, we do for pollination of certain food crops, especially when grown at large and in industrial scales. Uh, because they can be managed and transported around the country to where they are needed, they can be used to pollinate crops like, like this almond orchard, which is a feast or famine situation on a grand scale. There is a flood of flowers for a few weeks in early spring, but after that, there's very few flowers in this landscape that is essentially an ecological desert because the understory is heavily treated with herbicides. So there's no food for native bees here after the almonds flower. So the honeybees are brought in by the truckload to poll pollinate this crop, and then they are moved to the next crop that comes into flower. So I think I just want to make the case that native bees are generally underappreciated as pollinators. Uh, there are lots of examples of farms that do not need honeybees to pollinate their crops, um, particularly in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a lot of regions in our state where we have smaller farms interspersed with forests and other natural habitats where honeybees are not needed to pollinate um, the crops. And, you know, especially where those farms are trying to, you know, implement best management practices for pollinators by minimizing their use of pesticides, you know, using very careful timing of the application of those pesticides to minimize contact with native pollinators, um, you know, providing natural habitats around their farms. There's lots of ways that native pollinators can coexist with, with farming, with farms and, and benefit those farms. And there's some crops that really are best pollinated or even can only be pollinated by our native bees. So what can we do to be part of the solution to help pollinators as facing these, these threats that, that we know about? Well, there is a lot that you can do to help pollinators in your own backyard, wherever you live. Uh, Lori is going to talk to you more about ways to enhance your home gardens for a wild variety, wide variety of pollinators. I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about ways to um, or about the importance of natural habitats for pollinators and how mimicking nature in our own home spaces can be both a challenge and an inspiration. Uh, so one of the most important things we can do for pollinators is to protect their best habitats. Some habitats can't be recreated because they form under very specific soil and environmental conditions like the shale barrens shown at right or because it takes a really long time for the habitat to develop, such as an old growth forest. So this is where your support of conservation organizations like the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy are key. Protecting special places is the best and sometimes the only way to protect unique plants and animals that live there. Uh, an old growth forest is a really great example of a special habitat. They're undisturbed forest floors resist colonization by invasive plants, and they're an absolute haven for ephemeral spring wildflowers. Uh, spring ephemerals are a really important food source for pollinators in the spring. Uh, these wildflowers have evolved to grow in a short window of time in early spring when there's enough sunlight reaching the forest floor before the leaf canopy fully expands. 
barrens are another special habitat that are difficult to recreate because they form over very specific soil and under very unique environmental conditions. Now, the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program has been studying the plants and wildlife of barrens, uh, particularly the butterflies and moths, for many years. And we have documented the unique plant and animal communities and rare species that are found there. And we expected that the barrens would be just as interesting and important for um, native bees as well. So we recently participated in a regional conserv conservation needs project that included 10 states in the Northeast. And we looked at the bees of barrens. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we looked at four barren sites across the state from sand dunes in Presque Isle State Park to shale barrens on a Western Pennsylvania Conservancy property at Sidling Hill in Bedford and Fulton counties, and two pitch pine scrub oak barrens, one in Cumberland County and the other in Center County. Um, here's some, some highlights from two years of bee surveys at just one of these sites, the pitch pine scrub oak barrens in Center County. Uh, we documented 100 different species of bees, two globally vulnerable bumblebees. We got five state records, meaning five species of bees that had not previously been known to occur in Pennsylvania, um, including this, this cute little uh, bee shown at right, which specializes on sink foil. It doesn't have a common name, but you could call it the, the sink foil bee. Uh, we got 11 county records of bees that had not previously been documented for Center County, which is pretty remarkable uh, given the proximity of the site to the internationally renowned Center of Pollinator Research at Penn State. And we found 12 specialist bees. These are species that require the pollen or oils that are provided by specific plants. So we find that special habitats like barrens have diverse and unique plant communities that in turn support diverse and unique pollinator communities. Specialist bees are important, an important component of that diversity. Roughly 25% of the approximately 770 species of bees we have in the eastern US are pollen specialists. So pollen specialists, again, they, they collect pollen from just one family or a few related genera of plants. And super specialists or monolectic bees, they only collect pollen from a single plant genus or species. So something, you know, we, we can't recreate a barrens or old growth ecosystem in our backyards unless you're lucky and it already exists there. Uh, we can encourage more of the plants that specialist pollinators need by planting them in our yards. And here's a couple of great resources that you can use to look um, up plants that, that benefit specialist bees. And um, I also wanna point you to there's uh, a guide that was put out by the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, which is uh, about habitat management for pollinators. And in that guide, there's a section on um, the, the plants that certain butterflies and moths need. So in a similar way, there's specialist um, butterflies and moths that need specific plants. And you think the monarch and milkweed or the Baltimore checker spot and turtle head. So uh, this habitat management for pollinators guide has um, a list of plants that are important for Lepidoptera and also has a lot of other, oops, a lot of other um, recommendations for managing your property for pollinators. So of course, you know, choosing natives is, is really important. I think this idea is gaining traction and public awareness, but it is slow to take hold in lawn and garden centers. So one thing you can do is go to your, your local center and tell them you want them to carry native plants because you know, they're more nutritious, more diverse, more beneficial for our pollinators. And invasive, you know, introduced exotic species can become invasives. Even those that start out well-behaved can change over time. And like with health recommendations for ourselves, um, you know, we always want to keep track of the most up to date um, research about what what we can do to make healthy choices. Same goes if you're trying to make your your property good for pollinators. Um, even the most well intentioned recommendations may need to change if new information shows they don't work so well in practice. So here's two examples of pollinator friendly activities that may not work as well as intended in all circumstances. So I provided a couple of resources here where you can learn more about how to use these techniques successfully and avoid the pitfalls. And if you have the space and are up for a bigger challenge and reward, you can consider taking inspiration from Mother Nature and convert a monoculture of lawn or retired 
uh, farm fields into diverse wildflower meadows. I'll show you two examples of places where this has been done. Uh, the first is a former farmland at Bear Run Nature Reserve, where the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy took 43 acres of degraded agricultural fields with eroded soils and restored them into beautiful meadows with native grasses and wildflowers. These meadows provide valuable nutrition and shelter for pollinators and other wildlife. They help improve soil quality, filter nutrients, and build resiliency against climate change and invasive species. And this project was made possible with the support of the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. Another example is this colorful wildflower meadow that was created by Conservancy member, board member, and volunteer Carolyn Hendricks and her husband, Steve. Uh, they created this meadow on what was formerly an eight acre hayfield at their home in Bedford County. And Carolyn was so inspired by the success of the Bear Run project and her own meadow conversion that she donated funds to help establish more pollinator habitats on conservancy owned preserves. So I have listed on this slide, you know, the basic steps for creating a meadow over a former turf or agricultural site, but there is a lot more to it. So I've um, listed just one resource uh, from the Department of Conservation Natural Resources. That's a good one, but there's lots of resources on, on the internet. So this is my final slide of resources. Uh, this includes the ones I mentioned in my talk, plus a few others. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that Lori can get her presentation loaded. But just please note, you will get a link to this recording. Uh, so you will be able to look at these resources again. And a few reminders uh, before I turn over the presentation to Lori, uh, please use the Q&A button. Uh, to submit your, your questions, and we will answer them as we have time at the end. And um, you can also always submit your questions to us at info at paconserve.org. All right, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Lori. Thanks, Betsy. So I am going to be talking about um, principles and solutions that can be used to create pollinator friendly landscape um, at home by highlighting just a few of the Conservancy's community flower gardens as examples of these principles. Um, the first one, as Betsy already mentioned, is choosing native plants. Um, frequently, it right now the way that the nursery industry is set up it can be challenging at times to find straight species of native plants um, in that case it is okay to use what we call native bars or cultivars of native plants um, i do want to mention that it is best practice to go with the native species but there are times that using native cultivars are appropriate um, and cultivars are just plants that have been selectively bred to have desirable qualities, like a smaller size or improved disease resistance, but this breeding can have an impact on nectar and pollen quantities. Um, so it's important, especially if you're doing something like a restoration site, to use native species and avoid cultivars. Um, however, in a garden, it may be necessary at times to use a cultivar. Um, and even if someone chooses a native R over a non-native plant, I'm happy with that because that still improves habitat. And the first thing that I would like to talk about would be planting a wide variety of plants that bloom from early spring into late fall. Um, that's because pollinators need nectar and pollen as soon as they are done overwintering in the spring and then also need to stock up for winter in the fall. And this is a photo of one of the Conservancy's rain gardens, which is at Lincoln Avenue, Frankstown Avenue in Lincoln Larimer in the city of Pittsburgh. And this is taken in the fall. So you can see how much is still blooming. Um, and rain gardens are engineered spaces that are designed to increase rain runoff absorption back into the soil. So the deep roots of the native plants that rain gardens are planted with help filter water and break up the soil to increase permeation. Um, but this garden was not always a rain garden. The, that portion was installed in 2020. Um, and the reason that it was installed was because this site prior to 2020 was 
a vacant lot that the Conservancy had used as an annual flower garden um, that is adjacent to the school Lincoln pre-K through five. The students at the school would help us plant the annual bed at the site every year. Um, but teachers and students had requested a few years ago a pollinator garden. And we had previously identified the space as one that would benefit from some green infrastructure stormwater capture. So now this garden does double duty. It can intercept 2,500 gallons of stormwater runoff per rain event um, with the potential to intercept 100,000 gallons of stormwater annually. And it's used throughout the school year as a teaching tool. Um, and the Conservancy also recently collaborated with CMU graduate students to create uh, artificial intelligence that the Lincoln students um, have been able to use to with tablets to interact with the garden. Um, and it goes a little more in depth about the rain garden and the pollinators who visit it. In the winter, um, I know that a lot of people cut back their perennials in the fall. Um, but even though gardens look dead in the winter, we know that they really aren't. So this is a photo, same garden. Um, all of the standing spent plants offer nesting materials and shelter for overwintering pollinators and the seeds provide food for birds. So a good rule of thumb is to wait until temperatures are consistently over 50 degrees, 50 degrees in the spring to avoid accidentally cutting down plant stalks that might be the winter home of bees and their young. And then of course, once winter's over, spring plants start blooming. So in this garden, you can see the penstemon blooming um, and spring blooming plants offer early nectar resources. And then of course it's summer. So that's when we're used to seeing things blooming, but you can see how different the garden looks through each season and how many different types of plants are blooming from spring through fall. And I've highlighted a couple of plants in each section. And the first one is Beard tongue, um, which is scientific name Penstemon digitalis. It blooms in the spring. They're great rain garden plants because they tolerate both drought and wet soil. Um, and they also attract a variety of bees. You can see that the flowers of this plant are tubular, which is an adaptation that allows certain bees' mouth parts to better fit to get the nectar out of them. And the next is New England aster. This is a good fall blooming plant um, and it's Symphiotrichum novi angliae. And I am giving the Latin names because it is important to ask for plants by their scientific name to be sure that you're getting the correct plant. For instance, lots of plants are called asters, but many of the asters available in nurseries are China asters, which of course are native to China, not the US. So you don't have to know how to pronounce the Latin names. You can write them down on a piece of paper and take them to your local nursery and they'll be able to find the plant for you. But this aster gets up to six feet tall. Um, in this particular garden, a cultivar was chosen um, because since kids are frequently using the site um, and this plant can get up to six feet, wanted to make sure that the students would be able to see into the garden. Um, so that's an instance where it would be appropriate to use a cultivar. And the next pollinator garden principle to keep in mind is using host plants, which include grasses, shrubs, and trees. And so this is a garden. It's at Grant Street and First Ave in downtown Pittsburgh. It is a pollinator garden. Um, and you can see there's a wide variety of plants that bloom from spring into fall. And this garden incorporates many grasses, trees, and shrubs. Um, grasses, trees, and shrubs support a huge range of pollinating insects. And I think sometimes we forget about them when we're talking about pollinator plants, but even like oak trees support, I think a recorded 500 species of pollinators. So at this site, which was installed in 2021, um, we received funding not only for the garden plants, but for the educational signage. Um, and this signage is helpful to explain to people the purpose of the garden and to highlight specific plants so that folks walking by can understand the role that this garden plays in supporting pollinators. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and that's important because 
habitat fragmentation plays such a direct role in pollinator decline, especially in an urban environment, there might be a lot of space between plants that pollinators can visit, get their needs met. So having something this large in downtown Pittsburgh provides those resources. And when the, we received the funding, um, we needed to come up with a design that would fill a large space that would meet the needs of pollinators. Um, so when designing, especially in a large area, I always start with trees and shrubs first. Um, those are the architecture of, of a design and you can fill in around them once they're in place. They're also good to use to create rhythm and repetition in a design, which is important to making it aesthetically pleasing. So once you have trees and shrubs in place, design looks balanced, you have a little more freedom to fill up the empty spaces without having to worry as much about distracting from the aesthetics. Um, and so many woody plants and grasses are great for pollinators. For instance, switchgrass, which is Panicum brigatum. Um, it's a host plant for skippers, which are small butterflies, and the seeds provide food and shelter for birds. Grasses also do a great job of providing uh, visual interest in the winter. And a beautiful tree that hosts butterflies is the alternate leaf dogwood, Cornus alternifolia. It's a host plant for the spring azure caterpillar and the fruits feed birds, um, including the ruffed grouse, which is Pennsylvania state bird. And because many of our gardens are in urban areas or roadsides, they're not necessarily ideal spots for gardens, but a good way to solve site issues is to keep in man, mind right plant, right place, which is just a way of saying, don't try to force something to grow where it doesn't want to. So this is a garden that's at the 223060 interchange along the parkway. This garden didn't always look like it did in the photo. Prior to 2019, this was a problem site um, where we frequently had perennials that were dying because the site held standing water. So yeah, you can see there. I had the thought that it might work out to create a sort of buffer bed that used native plants that I knew would do well having wet feet at times. And one of those is Iris versicolor, it's blue flag iris. It's a plant that's native to marshes and swamps um, and it needs standing water to be able to grow. I also tried to choose plants that were deer resistant for this site. Um, I know that that's probably a question that folks may have. Every plant I'm going to show you is deer resistant, but I do wanna say that there are no plants that I know of that a deer won't try to take a bite out of at least once. But with native plants, most of them rebound really well if they are eaten by something. And one of my favorite plants is Joe Pieweed or Eutrochium purpurium. Um, gets up to seven feet tall and will be covered in pollinators and smells beautifully. Beautiful, sorry. It also tolerates being wet and you'll see them along rivers and streams. Um, also goldfinches will eat the seeds. Um, and again, selecting native plants can help in solving problem areas because many of the problems we experience in our yards like clay soil or dry shade are conditions that are found in natural areas where native plants grow. Um, something else that is a big help is replacing non-native plants with natives. That will not only help the environment, but can help you save a headache when you're trying to find solutions in your own yard. So we are working on replacing non-natives in all of our community gardens, but one place where we recently made a big change is the garden at the Highland Park Bridge. So this is a picture right after planting this year. And prior to that, there's miscanthus grass, which is considered invasive. It was planted at this site about 20 years ago before it was on the invasive species list. Um, and of course, many of the invasive species that we are dealing with now um, are plants that escaped from people's yards. So they were attractive and were planted and then escaped and survived so well that they spread to other places and now outcompete a lot of our native plants. It's, so that's why it's important to check um, DCNR's list of invasive plants if you're not sure, um, as well as the plants on the watch list, which is also uh, created by DCNR, um, just to make sure that you're not purchasing something invasive. 
So that's why it's important to know your plant names and you can avoid all of that by just choosing native plants. So now a lot of times when people say, okay, I'm gonna make a pollinator garden, what's a good plant? The first thing that comes to mind is butterfly bush. But of course, butterfly bush is not native. It is native to China. What is native is Asclepius tuberosa. Its common name is butterfly weed. This is a plant in the milkweed family. Um, they love sun sh and shallow soil and are a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And then another good swap um, is using inkberry, which is Ilex glabra, in place of boxwoods. Boxwoods are typically used as hedges. Um, and they are not invasive, but they are not native and they can also be a little bit finicky. So Ilex glabra works really well as a substitute. Um, it's in the holly family, it's evergreen um, and grow, develops dark blackberries that birds eat after it blooms tiny white flowers that attract small bees. And speaking of small, when you're making these changes, you can start small. Um, so for instance, this is a photo of a garden at Frankstown Ave and Bennett Street in Homewood. The garden had four annual beds. And as we were assessing improving our garden's habitat benefit, we wanted to add a pollinator component to the site, but we weren't able to convert the whole site at once. So instead we planted 11 shrubs and six grasses. Wasn't that much, but it, creates a small patch of pollinator habitat. Um, and at home, you can start as small as putting out a pot or two with a plant that will attract pollinators like horse mint, which is Monarda punctata. Um, this stays small, doesn't need much water, and it will be covered with native bees and butterflies and is a really unique looking flower. Um, easy to grow and the plant is a short-lived perennial, which means it tends to die off after about three years, but luckily they self-seed. Um, I started with one of these in my yard and I now have five after about four years of growing. So because they start from seed so easily, that saves you money because obviously seeds are much less expensive than plants. And once you have one, um, you'll have seeds for more. Another plant that starts from seed easily is milkweed. Um, this is Asclepius syriaca, which is common milkweed. Uh, plants in the Asclepius genus are host plants for monarch butterflies. Um, the common milkweed gets up to about four feet tall and will grow pretty much anywhere. If you can only plant one plant to support pollinators, uh, this would be the one to choose. And now upcoming projects. We have a couple pollinator gardens upcoming um, that I wanted to highlight. The first one is the Neighborhood North Museum of Play in Beaver Falls. Um, this nonprofit reached out to us looking for help creating a pollinator garden that the kids who attend the programming could interact with. Um, so this is the four. And then this is the planting plan. I did a design where there was a lot of plants in small beds to leave space for people to walk through the garden between the plants. And this is actually being planted today as we speak. Um, and next is at Rhode Island Road in Maple Lane and Penn Hills. Community members had reached out to the Conservancy about converting this old lot that held a gas station into a welcoming pollinator garden that folks would see as they enter Penn Hills. So to make it eye-catching, we used a lot of color and diversity of plants that are planted in swaths of the same plant, and that's mass planting, um, which is really helpful for helping pollinators locate the plants that they need. It's a lot easier to see a big swath of Rubecchia or Black-Eyed Susans from above than to try and find one little plant in a garden. And this garden was planted this past weekend. Um, so beyond these projects, what's next? Well, the Conservancy's Community Flower Gardens program has a long history of providing beautiful and aesthetically pleasing gateway gardens. Um, our current garden program consists of 130 green spaces in 20 counties across Western Pennsylvania. Um, almost all of these sites are maintained with local community involvement. And over the past five years, we've taken an in-depth look at the gardens to identify ways to expand their benefits. So new funding opportunities have allowed us to implement several additions to existing gardens. Um, and we will be continuing to assess and convert square footage in our gardens to pollinator habitat. And in fact, 
in the last year, 10,000 square feet of beds were converted to pollinator habitat, which we were able to do because every year, more and more people are interested in helping to support this work, including all of you, just by attending this webinar. So if you're interested in participating with us, um, we have so many volunteer opportunities for people like you who care about our region, from planting trees and gardens to trail maintenance on nature preserves to in-office clerical assistance. If you're interested in volunteering, you can visit waterlandlife.org or email volunteer at paconserve.org. And finally, our work would not be possible without our members and donors. So if you'd like to donate to support our work or check out the benefits of becoming a member, please visit waterlandlife.org slash donate. And I could continue to go on about pollinators, but we only have an hour. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen for the question and answer portion of our webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lori and Betsy. Wow, that was super informative. I There's I, everything I wanted to know about bees and pollinators and butterflies. So, or probably not everything, but <laughs> like you said, you could talk forever. Um, my name is Jen Kissel. I'm the communications uh, specialist at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Thank you everybody for coming and I hope you're enjoying the webinar so far. And we have uh, lots of questions coming in. So we're gonna get started with that. And I think you're gonna find um, the answers to these questions really informative too. Sometimes this is, you know, like the second best part. So starting off, um, and I, I'm not quite sure which one of you is going to want to answer which question. I think you're both capable of these. So um, first come, first served, I guess. What attracts a pollinator to a plant, a particular plant? Its smell, its color, uh, is the, or is the attraction different for species? I can, I can say something and Lori can add. Um, I think, yes, the, the color, um, definitely, once the insect gets within visual distance of the flower. Um, but there's a lot of chemical communication going on that we're, we're pretty uh, oblivious to. I mean, we notice the smell of flowers when we get up close to them, but insects are extremely sensitive to chemical cues that are uh, out there in the environment from from greater distances. So there's a lot of communication going on between plants and insects chemically through the, the plants emit volatile chemicals that the that the insects can pick up on and kind of hone in on. Lori, did you want to add anything or is that? No, I think Betsy covered it. Okay. How far from their hives do honeybees travel? So I, I looked that up for this webinar because I was curious. It's not a fact I had at my fingertips, but it's about five miles. But that would be, five miles would be not the typical distance. They don't want to travel that far if they don't have to. They're going to you know, stick as close as possible to um, their hive so they don't waste energy. But they can travel that far if they need to. Um, I mentioned about how you can find bee pathogen, the, the, the diseases and, and pests that, that the honeybees carry, you can find them on the, the flowers. Um, and that tends to be highest at closer distances to their colonies. So as you get to those farther distances, those rates of pests and, and pathogens also go down. So by the time you're about a third of a mile away from the honeybee colony, those, those rates of um, of those things that they're carrying, they, they go down to about, you know, pretty negligible. Okay. I have Russian sage and it seems to draw lots of bees, but some neighbors have told me it is drawing dangerous wasps. Do you know if it's a good plant or not? That's Russian sage. Um, so Russian sage is a plant that pollinators visit a lot. Um, by its name, you can tell it's a non-native plant. Um, plants are not necessarily good or bad, depends what you want them to do for you. Um, that being said, 
I don't know necessarily about the safety of the wasps, although all of the wasps that I have encountered that visit pollinating or plants that I see other pollinators on have been non-aggressive. Um, additionally, the Russian sage, it does get visited by a lot of pollinators. There might be other plants that would be um, more suitable or would attract a different pollinator that you might prefer to have, um, especially maybe native ones. Um, there are some native salvias that you can use and bee balm is another one that sort of has a similar um, minty smell, pretty flower. Um, but yeah, Betsy, I'm not sure about the wasps. Yeah, I, I agree when that when bees and wasps are visiting flowers, that's not a time that they're aggressive because they're not um, at their nest. That's where you're going to get aggressive behavior, you know, unless the flowers are right at their nest. But, you know, most of our wasps are native, just like most of our, our bees are native and they have an important role in the ecosystem. So unless you're, you know, have concerns, you know, about somebody being allergic in the family or whatever, that you need to limit how close flowering plants are to your house or something like that. You know, I, um, I, I pet bumblebees when they're on flowers. They're, they're just that distracted by, by feeding. So it's, it would be really rare unless you're like grabbing the, the insect that it would sting you in that kind of a situation. That might be the first time I've ever heard someone admit that they pet bumblebees, but that's pretty awesome. <laughs> I'll just do it. Yeah, it's yeah. basically to show like they're, they really don't want to waste their energy or their sting yeah. on you in that situation. They just want to get their food and get home. <laughs> cool. That's neat. Um, that actually is related to a question somebody else had. If I plant pollinating or pollinator flowers near my house, are bees more likely to build their hives? under my eaves or in my attic. So like a border garden on your house, will it attract them to build nests there? Not that I'm aware of. Um, that being said, I have I know that there are bees that bore holes into um, wood that's laying around. So I've heard of people having issues with that. There are some that live in the fence at my house, but they're very friendly. So I just, they're, you know, my neighbors that I see often in the spring. Um, but yeah, if that, if that is a concern, I would say maybe putting the garden um, somewhere that's not as close to the house. Um, or yeah, I think that that would probably be the best recommendation. I, I do want to say that I am in, um, and I'm not allergic to bees, so if anyone's allergic, of course, you don't want to have them close to you, but I'm in gardens um, pretty much from April to October. I've only been, and I've been doing this for a solid six years. I think I've been stung maybe once or twice when I accidentally leaned on a bee. Um, okay. Um, I've, I've actually read um, people who have trouble with wood borers. I don't know if this is good information. You can tell us. I've read that people with uh, bees that bore into their wooden siding um, can put wooden posts in their garden, like in the pollinator garden, and the bees, that'll give the bees something to bore into, but I, I don't know. That sounds like a good plan or not. Yeah, you can certainly, you can certainly encourage them to other, go other places, but once they start, I think prevention is the, the best thing. Like if you have siding, wood siding, keeping it well preserved with whatever paint or, or stain will discourage them. But if they start to bore into things, then they're, and they're nesting in there, then they're, they're also releasing chemicals and pheromones and things, and that just keeps drawing them back. So um, prevention is really your best, your best bet. Okay. Well, we're really getting a lot of questions. I'm seeing them flood in here, so we'll keep moving. Um, are plant lists for the WPC gardens available to listeners? 
Um, so that's something we've been working on was getting some of these lists um, on our website. Um, so specifically, no, but if you email um, that info at paconserve.org um, at requesting lists, I am happy to pass along um, several to give anyone an idea of some plants that they can work from. Um, what protection from deer and groundhogs does WPC use for city gardens? Because we don't have fencing. None. Um, so I do my best to uh, try to choose um, plants that are a bit more resistant. So plants that are um, have a, a strong smell, so are mintier, um, like a bee balm. Um, deer tend to leave alone a bit more and so do groundhogs but we're I mean the concern we're my thought too is we are building some habitat so if groundhogs are sharing the space and not doing you know too much harm to the garden we just sort of let them be as much as we can okay um for my backyard what is a good flowering pollinator plant that's good for a shallow dry soil area that's mostly shaded you want to um, think on that and come back to it you can uh canada anemone will grow in shade um, that is dry so will pucara um, which is also called coral bells those are two that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I have I have a lot of shallow, dry, shady soil in my yard. Um, I can tell you um, there's things that I'm sort of surprised do well. They don't need as much moisture as I thought. Things like uh, Virginia bluebells, um, bloodroot, um, woodland phlox. Uh, I really like a golden or round leaf groundsel, or it's also called uh, ragworts. Um, that's one of my absolute favorites. They're just so beautiful. Um, did I say woodland asters? Um, and things like Pennsylvania sedge. Again, don't forget about the, the sedges. And um, that's a nice shade loving sedge. It's really has a pretty delicate growth habit. Okay. This is a great question. Can you tell us a good source for seeds for pollinator plants? Um, I can try. Uh, we're lucky here in Pittsburgh to be close to um, Audubon Nature Reserve at Beechwood Farms. Um, there's a native plant nursery there where there are frequent sales um, and I know that they sell seeds there at times as well. Um, I believe Wild Ones has um, seeds available as well as I'm, I'm not I can't think of any off the top of my head that I know for sure are all native. Uh, what about Ernst and Meadville? Oh I'm sorry Ernst and Meadville yes thank you. Um, have there been any successes in converting reclaimed strip mines to pollinator habitat and do you have any references? There have been. I'm not going to be able to come up with references off the top of my head, but I could look some up. I know there's been some really good projects. I'm thinking there was like a it was like a um, super fun site out towards Reading um, where they converted a, a site into a, a really nice warm season grassland. So that is definitely something that's been done, but I can't give you any sources off the top of my head, but I can look look them up, look something up. Okay. Um, yeah, Michael, if you'd like to um, send an email to info at, then maybe Betsy could get back to you at a later date. Um, here's a question. Any tips or resources for creating an aesthetically pleasing garden and maintaining it? From experience, groups of native, native plants intentionally clumped together when you plant them tend to spread and then they change the look of the garden over time. So is there a way to control that? Um, you can control that by hand pulling when you see the seedlings starting to move. Um, you can also 
I know that there are some folks who will use, who will plant in a pot and then sort of sink the pot into the garden soil. So that helps control some of the plant migration. Um, but yeah, I think that hand pulling is probably going to be your best bet for that. Okay. Yeah, and that's a great opportunity. I mean, think about how much you pay for a native plant, you know. <laughs> I, I try to find a new place for them if I can or give them to somebody else. So it's a it's, think of it as, you know, money growing in your yard. You can share, share as gifts or, or try and find another spot to put them. But yeah, it is kind of an ongoing battle, <laughs> but it's a good it's a good fight to have. Mm -hmm. Why is the pesticide DB being shut down? Is that? So that's probably the thing I was talking about. The um, that's the US Geologic Surveys database that's being dismantled. Um, I don't I don't know why. I mean, I have some ideas why, but it's there's probably some political things going on there. Uh, the, the cost of the program, it's not a really expensive program, you know, in the grand scheme of things that um, public records have it at uh, between $90,000 and $150,000 a year to maintain the database and the staff who run it. Um, but obviously, you know, this pesticide data doesn't always, um, there may be, like I said, political opponents to that data being out there because of the ramifications it has for, for their use of pesticides. But I don't know. I don't know for sure what's going on just that it's happening and it's there's a lot of opposition to the loss of this data set because it's just super critical to pollinator and and you know human health research thanks um we're gonna have to wrap it up soon but i'll uh, read a couple more questions and um there's still lots of people on um you know we have a little bit more more time on zoom so we'll keep going until everyone's exhausted uh are there any this is interesting are there any studies being done that you know of regarding impact of insect traps with LED lights um, that are so popular. Assuming they are bad, is there any work being done to ban or provide warnings to consumers? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know how widely used those are, and if you know, I, I could, I could see that it could have an inf impact on a very local scale. Um, but probably what would really vastly outweigh that would be just the regular lights that we have in our landscape in, in cities and towns and rural places. Those lights are, you know, everywhere and they have, they're really a much bigger contribution to light pollution, which also, you know, definitely has an impact on um, insects and all sorts of wildlife. So, um, but I, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't researched if there's been any studies on the impacts of those, those will, I'm assuming you're like bug zapper type lights. Right. Um, one or two more questions here. I have about 20 square feet of uh, rectangular ground available with six inches of topsoil that is well lit and not especially wet or dry. How many plants can I put in? I have milkweed already and it's growing well and comes back every year. So he's saying about 20 square feet um, with six inches of topsoil, what's a good number of plants to put in there? Um, well, it depends on the size of the plants that you're choosing, but um, I would say most of them probably need about, you know, two to three square feet around them um, to fill in. So, and you said about 20, was that right? 20 square feet? About 20 square feet. 20 mm -hmm. square feet. So I'd say 10 to 15 would probably fit well, depending on the plant. Obviously, if you put, you know, a shrub or something in there, it's going to need more space. Um, like the, the small butterfly weed that I showed in my presentation will need less. But I'd say, yeah, 10 to 15 is probably a good place to start. And then they could be divided if they spread. Yeah. And I will caveat that by saying I tend to start gardens pretty full and remove plants and plant them other places as needed because it cuts down on the weeding that you have to do initially. Good tip. 
Um, <clears throat> here's one or two more, but we keep getting questions. <laughs> this is great. Uh, I'd like some help with design. I'd like to convert most of my lawn to pollinator garden for pollinator species. I can buy the plants and I can get them planted, but I need help with the design. Any suggestions on um, who can help or where to go instead of hiring, aside from hiring a landscape professional? Any resources where she could, good books maybe, or... Um, yeah, um, so on, I know on the uh, Penn State Extension website, there are pollinator planting plans that can be scaled. So, um, you know, it might show something that's for a space that's 10 by 30, but you can just sort of expand those numbers to scale it to the size of your yard. Um, I believe uh, the Audubon website also has pollinator planting plans, and um, there will be several others. I would encourage if you're living in Pennsylvania to use, um, to look those up on a website that's based in Pennsylvania and is a .org typically. Um, those aren't going to give you any suggestions of um, non-native or invasive plants. Okay. Um, I see some questions about removing invasives, how to remove invasive plants, things like that. Um, I, we're, we probably need to wrap up here. So I would suggest, um, one of the things I would suggest would be, um, if you go to our website, there is a webinar uh, titled Green Isn't Always Good. And I believe that Amy Jewett, our invasives um, coordinator specialist, um, discusses how to go about eradicating some of the invasives, I believe. Um, so that's a good place to start for those questions. Um, I would say we probably should wrap it up at this point. And I would encourage everyone, if you have a question that we didn't get to, to please email it to info at paconserve.org and keep in mind that within a day or two, you'll get a link to this webinar so you can watch it again and, and check out all those great resources that. Um, uh, Betsy and Lori provided, and uh, it will also be on our website eventually and on YouTube as well. So I uh, would like to thank you all again for attending, and um, thank you ladies for your great presentation. Bye. Thanks. Bye.